So we are here for our second in our series on Ready for Resurrection, End of Life uh, discussions and planning to the extent we can plan. Uh, we're going to be talking about medical aspects of that tonight. Uh, in the past, when I've done this series, I have um, I have presented on this and done so in, in rather uh, broad strokes and, and generic terms. Uh, we have a guest presenter with us tonight who will be able to tell us about that in uh, much more detail uh, and can actually answer your questions uh, with real answers rather than I don't know, but we'll investigate because probably my investigation would be calling him. Uh, Dr. Adam Schlichting, MD, MPH, uh, graduated from the University of Illinois and UIC Med School, uh, did a residency in critical care at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, uh, right along the highway between uh, where we stay and usually when we go to Cass Community Social Services there, uh, served at the University of Iowa Hospital and currently uh, is medical director at the ICU in one of the Advocate Aurora Hospitals outside of Milwaukee. Uh, for those who have not pieced it together yet, uh, Adam is my brother and for as long as I can remember uh, and probably before that too, his, his life's aspiration was to be a doctor uh, and now he is one. Uh, spending most of the time in the intensive care unit, uh, but also being down in the emergency department uh, on that end of critical care as well. Um, I am going to jump in with just a couple of things to open with, and I'm going to blitz through them pretty quickly. Um, obviously, anything that I'm saying in here, uh, folks know where to find me and can ask me at any time, so I will commend some of these things to you to check on your own. Uh, I want to leave a good amount of uh, enlighten us with, with his wisdom and experience. On your handout, uh, the first section has several scripture citations that all have to do with the fact that all of the physical stuff in the world, including our bodies, uh, God makes it. And in Genesis, what does God do? God makes these things. God looks at them and says... They're good. Yes. God says, it's good. God does not say, isn't it awesome that I've made some, some you know, like fleshy things to imprison people's souls in until they die? Um, you will not find that in your Bible. Uh, you will find that in Greek philosophical texts. Um, there is a lot in your Bibles about um, the value of our actual physical bodies. Jesus heals people. Jesus feeds people who are hungry. Jesus meets a lot of actual physical needs. Jesus does not say, well, it's okay that you're hungry because, uh, you know, up in heaven you'll be fine. No, Jesus says, who here has something to eat? And he, he makes that for people. Um, Jesus comes as a real person. Uh, to redeem us. That's the kind of value God puts on, on this creation. And the gospel writers are pretty explicit in pointing to things that say, yeah, when Jesus was raised, he had actual flesh. You know, he asks for something to eat. He says, here, stick your hand in here. You see, ghosts don't have bones. So sometimes in the history of the church, we've fallen into the trap of thinking that uh, what's going on with the body or the flesh um, is not relevant or doesn't matter, um, I, I would sincerely beg to differ. Uh, and by all means, please investigate those uh, scripture passages there uh, at your leisure. The other thing I will throw out there for you, um, and at a certain point this reference is going to become dated, but uh, I'm sure it is still within everybody's memory once you hear it. Uh, as we've said before, these are not conversations where you probably wake up in the morning uh, and whoever the first person you talk to in the morning is, you probably don't go, you know what I want to talk about today? If I end up in the ICU, I want you to do this, this, and this, but not that, that, and that. This is not stuff we like to talk about. We as a culture try to pretend it doesn't happen. Um, if you are here, you understand that, you know, this is these are important conversations to have. And if you need a little extra motivation to get on top of things and get these conversations going, I have two words for you, Terry Shivo. 
If we remember many years ago, a woman in the middle of a divorce, um, I don't remember what the cause was, but she ended up in a persistent vegetative state. The divorce was not final, so her husband still had power of attorney, and he was all in favor of pulling the plug. He, her family sued to keep that from happening. Um, it became a circus, and legislatures got involved, and um, yeah, if you can avoid that, um, you definitely want to do that. Um, just by, if people can, uh, if this applies to you, unmute yourself and chime in and say yes. Um, either, either through your work, uh, if you were a medical kind of person, or through just stuff that has happened in your life um, with family and friends, has anyone ever been in the room when a disagreement like that has started to happen. I, I know I have uh, in my uh, summer as a hospital chaplain. Uh, Adam, I see you waving your hands. Uh, anybody else ever seen or heard this happen? You don't have to share the, the details, but I uh, just want to get a sense of, of who has actually seen this mess start to explode. Mark, Mark has seen that. Um, so for those who have not, all I'll tell you is, uh, from what I have seen, it is not pretty. If you can avoid it, by all means do that. And um, uh, Adam, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let me know if you have any trouble with the screen share. Uh, and I'll mute myself so if I end up throwing profanity at the computer, you won't hear it. All right, I think I'm unmuted here and now we'll try sharing my screen. And as I'm figuring out the technological issues here, um, let's start off. Has anyone seen the movie Titanic? Yeah. So in the movie Titanic, was anyone surprised by the outcome? No, we knew how that was gonna end. The same with life. Everyone will ultimately die. As depressing as it is, everyone dies. So there's no surprises in this talk tonight. Now I need to switch slides. There we go. So purposes of today, we've already established everyone will ultimately die from something. What we're going to try to do today is make you a little more educated consumer as to how you can make different choices that can impact your life or, or your death as everyone's death is imminent, mine just as well as yours. Also gonna help you to try to help decide what's best for you. This is not the same decision you make now that you may be making in 10 years or the same decision you may have made 10 years ago. These should be dynamic choices. You can always change your mind, either to be more aggressive or less aggressive. Unfortunately, we'll talk about Sometimes once you've made a decision, you can't always share that decision very well. So if, if you're incapacitated, who can help you decide? Who can you designate to help make these decisions for you? Or if you've laid out most of your decisions and then a question comes up that you can't answer because you're on a breathing machine, how would you want your designees to make that choice? And then finally, outside of choosing a designee and, and someone to make decisions for you, who else should you share these thoughts with and, and how you want the end of your life to play out? This very much is not a sermon. I unfortunately deal with conversations like this day in and day out in the ICU. So have a lot of knowledge about that, but I'm not talking just for me to talk. If you have questions as we go along, please just shout them out. If you raise your hands, I may not see it in the camera. Um, so certainly feel free to interject questions anywhere as we're going along. This is for, for you to help make very difficult decisions. And uh, remember that you might need to unmute yourself to ask a question. Uh, and I'll throw this out there. I'll probably say it more than once. We're hoping that all of these sessions, including tonight, can be the beginning, the beginning of conversations. Of this will give you the starting point and give you the give you what you need to start it. This is not the the end product. No. Um, so very importantly, we've already established everyone will die. Mortality is 100%. Um, we are talking this evening about death and then ultimately resurrection, not immortality. Um, 
the the story of Lazarus. He was raised by Jesus four days after being entombed. Um, what ultimately happened to Lazarus, Eric? Did he go on to immortality? He died. Eventually. Exactly. He died again, but he died. So even those that have been resurrected, which does not happen very often, but even those that have been resurrected ultimately die again in their or, mortal Or life. resuscitated. Exactly. Maybe it was more of a resuscitation. Four days. We fed people in a coma for more than four days now. But ultimately, they always die at the end. That may be several minutes later. That may be several decades later. But everyone will ultimately die, as depressing as that is. It's a fact. Um, so just to, to illustrate to Donna, I did pay attention in some art classes. This is the resurrection of Lazarus. This was the Rembrandt version of it. And this was a little bit brighter um, Van Gogh version of the resurrection of Lazarus. Both Dutch painters. Um, so outside of what I'm telling you, even the scripture says people are destined to die. Everyone will die. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Um, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. So you sort of get the picture. The Bible also supports that everyone will ultimately die or their mortal life will end. I think I beat that one into the ground pretty well there. Um, resuscitation and life support and, and CPR, these are all things that we can do that they don't prevent death. They delay death. Again, it may be by, by a few seconds, a few minutes, or a few decades. Um, and there's a lot of different variations of that. But all the things that we do and all the things we'll be talking about, they forestall death, sometimes by just a short time. As I was talking to Eric, sort of figuring out how we should go about this evening, he gave me the, the thought that Good Friday always comes before Easter. So before resurrection and before ascending to heaven, everyone's mortal life will come to an end. Um if someone's 105 years old, I can tell you it's going to be coming up pretty soon. Sometimes deaths can be very sudden and not at all anticipated. Young children or or very sudden traumas or sudden cardiac death, and those are devastating. But ultimately, everyone will die from something, and we can't predict it very well. So now we get into a lot of the choices that can be made about towards the end of someone's life, or sometimes very suddenly in the middle of someone's life. There's a lot of modalities of life support. And what life support does is it it gives time. And sometimes it gives time for the body to heal. And, and sometimes it gives time that you're just stuck on machines and not having a good quality of life. And we'll go into slightly more detail on some of these things. And then sort of the ultimate life support is, is CPR. And we'll talk about that a little as well. So life support in general is it's the combination of medical medical equipment and treatments and medicines that can temporarily replace the functions of organ systems in the body. Um, we can support the lungs. We can support the heart. We can support the liver. We can support the kidneys. We can't support the brain very well. To support the brain and the, the central nervous system, it's mostly supporting everything else that that makes the brain function. So we can do heart transplants, we can do lung transplants, we can do intestine transplants, but we, we don't have a brain transplant. So the best we can do for the brain is support everything else that supports the brain. And by supporting all of these organs, it, it buys us time to see if, if those antibiotics are gonna work. It buys us time to see if the lungs can recover their function, but it gives us time. So many, many different things we can do uh, to support the lungs, whether that's giving oxygen or that's giving you know, pressurized air through a CPAP mask or a BiPAP mask. And those are often people use those at home for, for sleep apnea treatments. More invasively, breathing tubes can be put in, tracheostomies can be placed. Again, if we have any questions coming up, do let me know, but we'll kind of move through some of these quickly. This is someone on a breathing machine. And during COVID, we learned that if people lay on their front, you can actually get oxygen in their bodies better. So it's sometimes the breathing machine plus other modalities that we'll use. 
If someone's heart isn't working, there's medications we can use. If the medications alone aren't working, there's there's uh, mechanical devices that we can use. So an intraaortic balloon pump is a basically a balloon that inflates and it helps spread blood around the body. Or there's other devices like ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It removes some blood from the body, pumps it through an oxygenator, and then pumps it back into the body. So essentially bypassing the heart and the lungs, and people can live on these machines for days or weeks at a time, again, with the intention of letting the rest of the body heal. It temporizes. This is a, a picture of ECMO, removing the blood from the body, putting oxygen back in, and then putting that blood back into the body, not all the blood at once. If someone's kidneys shut down, most of us have probably met people on dialysis, and dialysis people can go to dialysis treatments for years and years. If someone's in the hospital and their kidneys suddenly shut down, we can start dialysis, or we can start other modalities that filter the blood and take the toxins out um, and then put the blood, the cleaner blood back into the body. So there's lots of different machines and medicines and things we can do. This is a, a continuous dialysis machine that gets used in the ICU. Again, we don't have very good uh, life support for the brain itself. It's supporting the other organ systems. One of the most sort of the ultimate life support is cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR just by raising hands. Has anyone learned CPR before? It is not at all rocket science. It's fairly straightforward and, and it actually can very much improve survival. We'll talk about some of those numbers in a minute, but it's Typically, the CPR is started, and then when the ambulance arrives, they'll put some breathing tubes in, they give some medicine. Sometimes we shock people's hearts to try to, the shocking actually stops the heart with the hope that it starts up again at a normal rate rather than going in crazy rhythms. So sort of the default medical care, whether someone's in the hospital or whether 911 is called, if that's someone who's two years old or someone's 102 years old, if the ambulance shows up, they're going to start full court press unless there's documentation saying don't do this. So someone who's in perfect health, absolutely that's the right thing to do. Someone who's full care in a nursing home, it may not be the right thing to do. And, and we'll be talking a little bit later about what are some of the breaks that you can put on if you don't think that's the right thing. CPR, occasionally the ambulance will not start CPR if there's obvious death. If someone's head is cut off, we can't fix that. If someone is, their body is cut entirely in half, that's something that can't be fixed. But by and large, if an ambulance is called and there's not a bracelet on someone's wrist or, or paperwork nearby, then they're going to get the full court press, which is the CPR and the medications and the breathing tubes and the breathing machines and the dialysis. Um, it's always possible after that's done, if family is able to find some paperwork or after a few days, people can't say, you know what, that's not right. I don't think they'd want this. And we can always back things off. But to start going down that road, um, it can be kind of a difficult time to say, we're three days into this, maybe we should stop. So again, there's things you could do in advance if you don't think all of these are right for you. Any questions so far? So about they, it. They, yeah, I have a question. If the um, if the EMT doesn't know better from any other source, he's obligated to start CPR. Yeah, okay. in in most states, it's essentially the law. If the healthcare provider uh, who's working finds someone in cardiac arrest, unless there's you know, and and the EMT's job is to resuscitate, bring to the hospital. So by and large, full court press is going to get started unless there's very clear. And, and there have been cases where people have the DNR paperwork and the paramedics look at it and say, it's not signed. I'm sorry. Um, so making sure that the the T's, they're, they're not complicated forms. And, and Pastor Eric will actually share these forms with you, but not complicated forms. But if the T's are not crossed and the I's not dotted, 
sometimes it makes things a little more difficult uh, if the ambulance is called. And that is true of emergency department people as well, not just the paramedics. If somebody is brought into the emergency department, almost regardless of how they get there or what lands them there, they they use every available tool. How and, long, and would... I've got another question about CPR. How long is it effective? Like without the um, defibrillator, how long can you do CPR and it be effective? So for the CPR to be effective, it it depends a little bit on what caused the heart to stop. Most people, most physicians would say after about 20 minutes, it hasn't been very good, um, good, good blood flow to the brain. The chances of making a good outcome are not very good. Now there's exceptions to that. There's been cases, particularly in, in young children who fall in, in ice water yeah. and it slows down their heart rates and it slows down all their metabolic processes that sometimes they can be pulled out of the, you know, submerged underwater hours after they went under and, and they can be resuscitated and their brains can work perfectly fine. So there's unfortunately so many variables, the longer the CPR, typically the, the worse the outcome though. Not an exact answer, sorry. That's okay, thank you. Um, And I would I would also mention that when anyone is admitted to the hospital, or even if you go in for, for an elective surgery, oftentimes someone will be asking you, if your heart stops, what would you want us to do? Not because they anticipate your heart stopping, but if something happens, you know, if we're going to try to give people a maximal outcome, we want to know. And if someone says, no, if my heart stops, it's my time to go. Keep me comfortable. We want to know that so that we don't go down the pathway of doing all the things that maybe you didn't want. So it's not the doctors or the nurses badgering you to find out, oh, do you want us to not resuscitate you? It's more to the effect of what are your desires? What do you want? And they want to keep their treatment in line with what you want. And if you say, I want everything, but if my heart stops, let me go, then they know that. And if something happens very suddenly, they can adhere to what your desires and what your wishes are. All right, we will move on. Does anyone remember, it was a little over a year ago, DeMar Hamlin, he was playing um, suddenly on the football field during a game, nationally televised, he collapsed on the field. CPR was started and he made this remarkable recovery. So DeMar Hamlin is a 24-year-old healthy athlete. He had no underlying organ failure. He had no metastatic cancer, no advanced dementia, paid close to a million dollars a year to be in, in top physical condition. Also happens that he was in a nationally televised game with medical professionals within 10 seconds of him collapsing they were taking care of him and CPR was started within about 12 seconds of his collapse. So very much best case scenario. Um, when they've looked at CPR that happens on TV, uh, about 70% of cases of, of people getting CPR on TV, they perk up and they get better. Um, when people are surveyed about what they think the effectiveness of CPR is, um, most people, and when they're surveyed in the United States, say about, yeah, 75% of people have a good recovery and, and survive. Unfortunately, it's, it's about 10% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest victims who, who survive to leave the hospital. So the numbers are not as, as positive as, as we would all hope. If we look at people who are in the hospital, um, a little bit faster response time for people on a regular hospital floor. It's about 25% of people whose heart stops, they're able to get it started again and they survive to leave the hospital. In the ICU, it's actually a little lower than that. Um, there's much more nursing availability and, and nurses in an ICU, it's typically one nurse taking care of two patients instead of a regular hospital floor 
where it's one nurse taking care of five or six or eight patients. Um, the reason that the ICU survival rates tend to be lower is someone's already critically ill in the ICU, and now on top of that critical illness is their heart has stopped. So that's sort of why the ICU survival rates are a little bit lower. But again, 19%, 25% are both a little higher than the, the typical out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Some of the best out-of-hospital cardiac arrest uh, results in the world are at O'Hare International Airport, because any direction you walk, within about 30 seconds, you'll find a defibrillator. There's lots of people around. There's lots of resources that can act very quickly. Unfortunately, at home, alone, especially if someone's alone, there's not resources to help them at that point. With cardiac arrest, whether it happens in the hospital or out of the hospital, the longer someone has their heart not beating well and, and the chest compressions, they replace about 25% of the cardiac output, even with the best chest compressions. So it's only doing a quarter of the work that someone's own heart can do on its own. Um, the brain is very sensitive to that. So the brain, it's about 2% of your body weight, um, but it takes about 20% of your cardiac output. So every time your heart squeezes, 20% of that blood goes straight to your brain. So if the heart stops and it's not pumping blood to the brain, if CPR is started, you're getting 20% of 25%, which is a not very high percent. I can't do that in my head. Um, if someone survives after CPR, they often have broken ribs or or the cartilage that connects the ribs to, to the breastbone. Um, if anyone has eaten rib tips before, that's what it is. Uh, but that cartilage often breaks. In order to compress the heart down to, to make the blood circulate, it, it causes some damage, unfortunately. Sometimes people can have what we call a persistent vegetative state. That's the Terry Schiavo, where someone does not wake up because of injuries sustained to the brain. Lots of options of doing a tracheostomy, keeping people on a breathing machine long-term or long-term breathing machines and feeding tubes. Um, and it, it also adds to the difficulty if, if there's a loved one that you see is not getting better, is that the right thing for them? And then that becomes a problem for the family to decide, should we stop all of this? So CPR, it's not the best outcomes, but should we not do CPR? It doesn't always give a great outcome. I think Damar Hamlin and the 10% the of people who do well would say, absolutely, please try. So it's a different answer for every person and a different answer for even the same person at different points in their life. Again, this is not an easy yes or no um, topic. Any questions? Yeah, the cardiac failure that, that Damar Hamlin had, is that a possibility for anyone? So they haven't fully said what happened to him. What, what sort of speculated and what would make a lot of sense is it was something called commotio cordis, which is it's the electrical activity of the heart. And if if someone gets hit in the chest at the exact right part of the electrical cycle of the heart, it causes the heart to go into a funny rhythm. It happens sometimes with um, children playing baseball, unfortunately children, but more often children, where they're struck in the chest with a baseball at exactly the right time, actually exactly the wrong time, that it just disrupts the electrical activity of the heart and the heart can't start itself the right way again and just sort of quivers in the chest. So that's actually something that that responds very well to defibrillation, the electricity to the heart. So he did not have a heart attack of a blockage of the artery per se. It was more the electrical activity of his heart. And again, every case is a little bit different. Thank you. Very good question though. It almost sounds like if you've gone into cardiac arrest, um, unless you're, as you said, in the bottom of a 32 degree pond, 
but assuming that's not the case, you you know just fall over at your house. Um, by the time the EMT gets there, after you call nine one one, is going to be in all intents purposes at least five minutes, maybe closer to ten. It would seem to me, based on what you're saying, the chances of you have being able to survive that with still your with still your marbles, for lack of a better word, yeah, the chances are very very low. And and that's I think very accurate. It's unfortunate, but but it's accurate. It's about ten percent of people with that out of hospital cardiac arrest survive. And we can make some predictions as to who's going to do well and who won't do as well. But by and large, it's it's not in not in the doctor's hands. Um, Unfortunately, it's not great outcomes from the CPR. But again, there are cases that do turn out very well. So exactly who's going to benefit from the CPR, it's very tough to say. Um, and, and I know I know you had said, um, yeah, you know, it's going to be a different decision for each person. It'll be different at different points in their lives. Uh, did you want me to touch on maybe some of the times that would be good to review that, or did you want to wait and do that uh, a little later? Oh, I've got a slide on that a little bit. Okay. Later. Well, if you've got a slide, then, then rock and roll. And it, and actually, as you were, you were kind of mentioning about, you know, surviving with your marbles, it, that very much plays into quality of life. You know, if you are very, very ill and in lots of pain all the time, it's maybe not the best quality of life. And if someone's heart stops and they're suffering every day of their life, if their heart stops, maybe that's not, not something that we should try to resuscitate. Or more importantly, maybe that's something that that person may not wish to be resuscitated back to. So quality of life is so important. And sitting here as we're all relatively healthy and able to participate in meetings, an acceptable quality of life right now may be different than, than what you say an acceptable quality of life is. So saying, I wouldn't want to live if other people need to feed me or other people need to bathe me or if I'm on a breathing machine. Again, these are a little bit of dynamic situations. If if you find in a few years you have a little trouble controlling your hands and, and you need some help eating, even though right now you say, I wouldn't want to live if I need someone else to feed me, well, in a few years, maybe it's not so bad. So making a decision now does not, does not need to remain that decision uh, for the rest of your life. These can be very dynamic things. You just write down on a piece of paper again, and we'll talk about exactly which forms to fill out. But these should be things that you reconsider regularly and, and can refocus at different points in your life. Again, kind of a moving target. Uh, just two quasi unrelated, but wanted to throw them in there as well. If someone is diagnosed with advanced cancer or an advanced organ failure of some sort, um, palliative care is often mentioned. And what palliative care does is it focuses on symptom management. There's actually been quite a bit of, of research that's been done looking at people with non-small cell lung cancer who also have palliative care started. And the people who have this palliative care, in addition to their aggressive cancer treatment and their chemotherapy, they have another team of doctors focused just on their symptoms. And the people who have that palliative care rate that their quality of life is better and they actually live longer if they have people focusing on their symptoms. So if someone has a difficult diagnosis or a cancer diagnosis that's spread all around the body, having a focus on symptom management will actually make their cancer care better as well. Related but somewhat distant to pal or somewhat different from palliative care is hospice in which case there's still a very strong focus on managing symptoms, but rather than looking at the numbers and looking at their blood pressure and looking at their oxygen levels, you're focused entirely on how does Jim laying in the bed look? Are you comfortable? No, let's give a little bit more medicine. I'm not going to worry that it may make your oxygen levels a little, a little bit lower. We're not worried about numbers. We're working just with 
how someone's symptoms are doing. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, for palliative care, what would be the expectation? Like how often would you see palliative care or do they work closely with your other physicians? Or they or or do they work separately? How would that how is that care coordinated? So it it depends a little bit on on the health system and the hospital. A lot of palliative care doctors um actually were oncologists and then transitioned over to palliative care. Palliative care as a specialty has really sort of come of age in the last 15 or 20 years. So there's a lot of overlap and, and many oncology doctors have also done extra training in palliative care. Um, there's cardiologists that have done it. There's brain surgeons that have done it. Um, but traditionally it was more cancer doctors and the, the interplay between them, many, um, many cancer clinics have palliative care team. That's sort of part of the multidisciplinary practice. Um, sometimes doctors may not want to start talking about palliative care because palliative care is sort of seen as equivalent to hospice and we're giving up. No, I think palliative care and, and if you or a loved one are diagnosed with something, having palliative care involved, if it's a, a bad um, fatal diagnosis, having palliative care involved, not to say I don't want to do anything, but more so to focus on symptoms is, is quite important. And sometimes just knowing it exists and asking for it. So the integration of how do you find a palliative care doctor, mostly if you ask for it, it'll happen. And sometimes it'll be brought up. And again, if, if it is brought up in the context of a hospitalization with a loved one, it's not necessarily the team is saying, oh, we're done here. It's we want someone to help focus on just symptom management. Okay. So we've talked about a lot of the, the choices and a lot of the things that, that permutations that you could go through. So how do you take control of some of these choices? Ultimately, you should make your own decisions about what you want and what you don't want as far as your medical care. Unfortunately, very frequently people, even if they've made these decisions, they can't voice the decisions very well when they're critically ill. So you need to share those decisions with people and share those decisions with people that you love and you trust so they can speak for you. I, I had an additional question, if, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Um, in your experience working as a doctor and in, in, in our families, some you know elderly uh, family members, they don't always seem rational and they don't always, well, they seem quite stubborn. Like, I don't want this, I don't, and they don't want to look at things. And and it's and it's not like you're trying to take over them and declare them an invalid of some sort. But from what I experienced, there's a lot of elderly that just simply don't want to believe or listen to anything rational. And they don't want to make these decisions. They don't want to make them at all. Yeah. And it's forced on family members. And how how do you help with addressing that kind of issue, somebody who's just just plain stubborn or or more than that. I, I, I don't know how to explain it more, but but that's my basic question. It doesn't want to deal with this. So they 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 won't make any decisions. They won't be having these conversations that uh -huh. that we're having now. Right. Exactly. If if you don't talk about death, it means you can avoid it, right? Right. No, I think a lot of people don't want to discuss their own mortality and and people don't want to discuss how they leave this world. And it's very difficult, especially when when someone ends up in the ICU bringing up things are not looking well. I don't think we're going to survive this. And there's a lot of, well, we're waiting for a miracle or oftentimes we'll hear I'm a fighter. I'm going to make it through this. Um, unfortunately, in most fights, there's also a loser. And by definition, miracles are very infrequent events. So banking on a miracle is not always the, the best plan of action. Mm -hmm. How to get people to be engaged in these. Um, 
again, that's that's one of the things that I'm so happy that so many people are interested in in talking about this now. Again, these are not fun conversations to have at any point in anyone's life, but it's so much more stressful when it's a doctor you've never met in the ICU talking to you about this may be the end of, of one of your loved one's lives. If these conversations have been handed in advance, then you can say, we've talked about this and, you know, my loved one would not want X, Y, and Z. And it just helps direct the care of those doctors. But how to, you know, the horse has been led to water, how to get someone to actually discuss this. It's difficult. I don't think I have a good answer. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? I think sometimes, um, depending on the person, uh, you can strategically apply guilt uh, and 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 use that and say, this is all going to land on me. I do not want this to land on me. I want to make sure I'm making the decisions that are in line with what you want. Uh, for some people, that might that might kind of break through. Um, sometimes it's a matter of persistence. Um, maybe your family member, at some you keep saying, you know what, we got to talk about this, and maybe at some point your family member finally snaps and says, I want you to pull the plug. There, are you happy? Well, yeah, I am. That's what I wanted to know all along. Um, and just, just cause I, this is for one of our regulars here in the evening in particular, I do want to point out that, um, uh, it is for people of every generation, uh, even the baby boomers, um, y'all will eventually age, uh, and, and death, it, it, it remains a perfect 100% mortality rate. So, uh, I know there are a couple of us who are usually here on Wednesday evenings and, uh, I try to push those buttons whenever I can, and you, you know who you are. So again, these are difficult conversations that people have, and difficult conversations for both yourself and, and your loved ones, and sort of refocusing and reminding yourself why you're having these conversations. Um, Sometimes if you don't have someone designated to make your decisions, it sort of defaults to, well, we need to see consensus. And I can't get everyone in my family to agree what we should watch on television, let alone, you know, very difficult discussions of what should we do if aunt so-and-so gets horribly ill. So reaching consensus is, is very difficult. So telling your loved ones, this is what I want. It takes a lot of guilt off of people if you know you're doing what your loved ones want. Um, for yourself, towards the end of life, there's a lot that you cannot control. And this gives you a degree of control. I want X or I don't want whatever. I think that that gives you a little bit of control when otherwise there's there's minimal control. And it, it kind of lets you leave this earth like you came into it on your own terms. If you want the breathing tubes and all the things, or if you don't want to leave this earth with breathing tubes in your mouth, you can help control that process. And, and ultimately, when God calls, again, these resuscitations and all the life support, um, we can delay things by a little bit, but we can't resurrect everyone and we can't make people immortal. So when God calls, you get to decide, I'm ready to go, or I'd like to try to stay with my mortal life just a bit longer. And I, and I see some of the resuscitations as almost like a negotiation between someone's body and God. The doctors and the nurses are doing some things, but it's, it's a bit of a negotiation period, maybe a little bit longer. So in Indiana, um, if you have your phone, you can take a picture of this little uh, QR code. Otherwise, Eric is sending out the forms as well. Um, this is the out of hospital, do not resuscitate order. So this is a legally binding document that someone can fill out if they've decided, I don't want CPR. You print out this form, you bring it to your doctor. And this is not like some of the other forms we'll talk about, where it's a laundry list of, I want this, I don't want this. If this form is filled out, it says, I do not want CPR. 
let me be comfortable and let me go. If your doctor fills it out and signs the form, they also need to say that you have a terminal condition. Um, so this may not apply to everyone uh, uniformly, but a terminal condition, again, your doctor, it's not fully defined what that is, but your doctor needs to be able to somewhat say, yes, someone has a terminal condition. Um, if your doctor fills it out, please have them scan it into your medical record as well and keep copies of this. Um, copies in places other than your safety deposit box. It needs to be readily available. Um, if your heart stops and you're at home and you don't want to be resuscitated, keeping that folded up in a safety deposit box at the bank is not going to prevent all of the CPR and things if you don't have that form with you, unfortunately. Uh, many people... Here. Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, let me just jump in here briefly. Uh... I just put in the chat here, and I will send it out uh, on Monday with all the updates for next week's session. Uh, but the link I put in the chat is to a folder that has these documents, and one of the thing, one of the documents is called "Links to Indiana Advanced Directives," available online. Uh, so if you go in there, there will be links to these things, and you can actually fill them out on your computer print them out or you can print them, fill them in by hand. But uh, all of these documents are in that folder um, for your convenience. Uh, like I said last week, two weeks ago, um, one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this series is to try and remove as many barriers or obstacles as possible to having these conversations. So you're saying that if you have this, this um, out of hospital, do not resuscitate, for it to be effective, you have to have a terminal condition. The, the form here, when your doctor signs for this particular form, um, I declare my attending physician is certified. I, uh, where was it? Um, there's somewhere that says there must be a terminal condition. Oh meaning that I have a terminal condition or a medical condition such that if I suffer cardiac or pulmonary failure, resuscitation will be unsuccessful, or within a short period, I would experience repeat cardiac or pulmonary failure resulting in death. Again, it leaves a little bit of leeway for a physician to fill out. Um, but for this particular out-of-hospital do not resuscitate order, um, it may not apply to absolutely everyone, even if they don't want CPR. There's other forms that exist that sort of bypass that must have a terminal condition. So it's okay. a little bit of semantics there, to be honest. The reason I ask that is because my husband and I both had that. Now he died out in the um out in the community. It was resuscitated, but there was no one that would they didn't even know who he was when they found him. So there was would be no way that they would have known that he had this. But the fact that I still have it, I don't have a terminal condition. I just would have to look at what I have as far as that goes. Some of these were signed a while ago when I don't think CPR was as effective as it is today. And nor there weren't so many um, of the, eight, what are the AEDs? Is that the right? AEDs. AEDs, there weren't so many AEDs in the community either. But that's why I'm asking, without a terminal condition. So I I will I just have tell to look you, around. honestly, if there is a form that's signed, whether someone has a terminal condition or not, if a paramedic sees that the form is signed by a doctor, they're going to honor it. Okay. So the only the only maybe hiccup with this form is you need to have your doctor say, yeah, they could have a terminal condition. Um, nobody lives to 120 years old. Are, right? Exactly. So everyone has a terminal condition. Life is a terminal condition. Um, mm -hmm. So the only maybe little hiccup with this form is you just need to make sure that the doctor's comfortable saying, yeah, we'll say that you have a terminal condition, but there's other forms that that are maybe even a little more applicable and helpful. I might. I'll have to check my trust and see if see what it says then, and see if the doctor signed it. And now the the next form, it's a little more detailed, 
And this is the Indiana Physician Order for Scope of Treatment. And this is, is probably a little bit more helpful even than the I don't want CPR form. This is the doctor still needs to sign it, but it says, you know, the person has an illness or a frailty or a condition. It doesn't necessarily say a terminal condition. And then you can check yes or no. Yes, I want CPR. No, I don't want CPR. Yes, I want life support. No, I don't want life support. Um, yes, I want antibiotics to be given. No, I, so it's a little bit of almost choose your own adventure. Um, you get to pick various things. And again, when a physician is signing this, you should talk about these options. What would they suggest? Would they say, yes, definitely do antibiotics and it's okay to do this, but maybe I wouldn't go with that. And again, this is more of a, a discussion form as much as it is just a piece of paper somebody signs. Um, I will point out in section D there, we have similar forms here in Wisconsin and, and in section D, people put all sorts of crazy things in there. Um, sometimes people request that they only get medicines that start with A um, or other people only want chest compressions with the left hand. Please don't get too creative here. It's a stressful time if the paramedics are, you know, reading the form and don't give them too many crazy permutations there or limitations. Um, when we look at both the, the do not resuscitate and the physician order for life-sustaining treatments, um, they need to be taken in context again. The do not resuscitate form is a, it's not a yes, no type form. It's a, if that form is filled out, someone does not want CPR, period. The, the post form is again, some more choices Yes, I want CPR. No, I don't want CPR. Yes, I want antibiotics. No, I don't want antibiotics. But there are so many other options out there. Would you want dialysis? Would you want um, Would you want ECMO? So, so many different things that you can't put every permutation on one form, which is all the more reason that having discussions with loved ones and having someone designated to help you make these choices um, can be helpful. If you didn't check it on a form, does it mean yes, you want it or no, you don't? Tough to say. Um, again, those are mostly yes, no questions, like binary questions, but your, your health is not just a binary thing and quality of life certainly is not a binary thing. So, reevaluating these choices that you've made every few years or every time you have a new diagnosis made or if things change. Um, you know, these are not set it and forget it forms. Again, so many permutations, even if you've filled out this paperwork saying, I want CPR or I don't want CPR, there's a lot of choices that that sometimes need to be made that if you are incapable of making those choices and if someone's in the ICU and and critically ill unfortunately 60 to 70% of them can't make these and can't voice these choices even if they've roughly demonstrated yes I want CPR no I don't want CPR yes I want a breathing machine no I don't so many other things that maybe would come into play that they didn't check a box for that's where you need someone to help make these decisions. And when you have these conversations with your loved ones and your, your appointed power of attorney people, um, it, it very much absolves them of the guilt of making a choice that they're not quite sure what you wanted. So when you're discussing potential options of, you know what, I would not want to be X, Y, or Z, they're acting on your wishes, not they're having to guess. So in Indiana, if you don't have a designated healthcare power of attorney, who makes the choices for you? Well, there's actually a kind of a laundry list here. First and most important is whoever the court appointed as your guardian. Maybe not everyone wants that. Or a spouse. What if your spouse is separated from you? You may still not want that person to be making choices. Then an adult child, a parent, 
goes on down the list and they're sort of uh, priority one through 10. The patient's religious superior, I don't know if that would default on Pastor Eric. I think that is more in the context of um, if someone is a, a Roman Catholic priest, it would default to their um, their bishop or something. Or maybe it goes to the Pope. I don't understand Catholicism. But I think it's more uh, the, the chief nun would decide for a, a minor nun or something. I don't think if you don't make a choice, Pastor Eric is going to be making the choice for you. Right, Eric? Yeah, I would uh, really prefer not to be in that uh, position, um, which is why I'm encouraging everybody to go and have these decisions. Um, so, yeah. But if you'll notice way at the top of that list with the little asterisk next to it is your designated agent. So um, there's actually a form you can fill out that says, this is who I want to make my choices for me. Um, so I think Eric has a copy of this form. And then there's another related similar form. Um, I, state your name, and then you put who you want to make your choices. And if they at the time are ill themselves, or if you were both involved in a car accident and they can't make a choice, who's your backup chooser? Um, and at any point you can re-sign the form and say, ooh, I don't want that person making a choice for me anymore. And then after you've put the names of two people, then you either have a notary public sign it and it's official, or you have two witnesses sign it. And Eric has said he's willing to sign forms for people so that largely he doesn't need to make these choices for you in the future. He's very happy to sign these forms. Um, so this is one version of the form. And then- Can I ask you a question about that again? I'm sorry, I have so many questions. Um, no, that we want to answer questions. Okay. The, um, if you have, I have two children. So pr prior to my husband's death, he would have been the default person to make the decision. I made it equal. Is there a problem with having two people have equal decision-making or are you better off having one? What I ended up doing is having both of them decide. And if they couldn't decide, appointing someone else to act as like a moderator. I think that could work very well. Um, again, we it's difficult to reach consensus. If it's two people and they both have known you their entire lives, I think they probably will align. And have you shared with them what your what your wishes would be? Yeah, ad nauseum. I'm tired of hearing about what my wishes are. In fact, well, I, I think what's all this death if, talk? If you feel that, that they would both agree to the same thoughts. I think that's very reasonable. And if there's something that you know, they can't agree on, you've already come up with sort of your, your tiebreaker person. And I think that's very reasonable. Okay. If it's someone has 18 children, chances are they're not going to reach full okay. consensus on something. Um, but two children, especially that you have shared with what you think is important and your values, um, I think is super reasonable. Okay. Question. Yes. Is, is this advanced directive same as living will? This is a little different than a living will. Oftentimes, this is a little more of a, a boilerplate. And I, I think you guys are doing a session next week, Eric, or is it in a week or two, where you'll probably get into a little more details about that even. A living will tends to be a little more uh, flowery language. And these are very boilerplate stock forms because it's for a very specific purpose. So um, in that folder that I, I put in the chat and then I'm going to email out, there is a, a form and it says Indiana Living Will Declaration. It very much overlaps the, uh, the post form uh, and some of the other forms. And it says... Um, you know, I direct the procedures be withheld or withdrawn, uh, you know, indicate your choice by making your mark. I wish to receive artificially supplied nutrition and hydration. I do not wish to receive nutrition or hydration. 
Uh, I make no decision about nutrition and hydration. Um, so this form is, uh, it doesn't seem to cover, it seems to cover just those two topics. Um, so probably the, the post form is going to be more helpful because it will give you more things that you can outline uh, in terms of, yes, I want this. No, I don't want that. Or even, yes, I want you to try this. And if I don't improve after blank amount of time, then so be it. So this form here is sort of, again, the one pager. Indiana also has another version of the form because one form isn't enough. It needs to be a little more confusing. They also have another form that's almost the exact same thing where you choose your healthcare representative, where you state your name, your date of birth, you put two people who your first person is, who your backup person is. And then before all the things are signed, you also say, you know, a little bit about what would kind of go on your post form. The quality of my life is more important than the length of my life or staying alive is more important to me no matter how sick or how unlikely my chances for recovery are. And then you can circle one or the other. So this is exactly the same as the previous form, but gives a little more insight as to my values are I would prefer to live as long as possible or I would prefer to live as comfortably as possible. I would suggest maybe going with this form just because it gives a little more information than this one does. The one pager versus the two pager. Now, these are forms that you fill out for Indiana. And if you live in Indiana, that's great. If you ever travel outside of Indiana, these forms will be respected in other states. The problem is if you don't have any forms that say who you want to make the choices for you, in Indiana, you've got your list of, if you don't have that designated agent, then the court-appointed person followed by a spouse, followed by an adult child. Not every state has that. So if you're visiting, say, Wisconsin, we don't have this list of people in priority. Wisconsin is a consensus state which means anybody that wants to, that shows up for these meetings to talk about what should we do with, with Adam since he can't speak for himself, anybody who happens to show up and say, yeah, I know him, he's my neighbor, and I think he wants X, Y, and Z, they may be in complete contrast with everyone the rest of my family is saying, but we try to reach consensus among everyone in Wisconsin, and it doesn't work well. So if you travel even a little bit out of state, I would again suggest having the Indiana form filled out because this demonstrates that, yes, I have put into thought who I want to make decisions for me. And even though we don't have uh, the exact same layout of who gets to make decisions, the form is respected in other states. And we have similar forms in Wisconsin to designate powers of attorney. So question, let's say- I yes. have Let's say I have these documents all filled out. We're traveling in Arizona and we get into something there. But the documents are here at home in Indiana. How does that work? So traveling with every copy of every document you've ever made is clearly not feasible. Um, Having these documents scanned into your medical record can be incredibly helpful. There's a few large medical record companies. Epic is, is the name of one of them. That if you have your, your forms and your power of attorney paperwork filled out in Indiana and it's in your medical record, they can actually pull that up even at different hospital systems that are using the same information. Typically, the... You know, if someone's incapacitated, then the hospitals are going to be reaching out to whoever they can on file. And if they call, say, a child and the child knows this form exists and absolutely your children, if you have them listed as someone, should know that they're on the form to be making decisions for you. Um, no surprises, please. Um, the 
uh, the hospital is probably going to be reaching out to them and then they should have a copy of this form and say, I am the power of attorney. They designated me. Thank you for calling me. And this is what they've told me they want. So it's it's a little less direct if the paperwork is not in your hand when you're becoming incapacitated. But realistically, no one has the paperwork with them all the time. So Epic is him as my chart? Uh, Ep yes, Epic is the, the company that makes my chart. Okay, so I can go to my doctor or my hospital that has my chart and ask him to scan all these. You got it. Your power of attorney paperwork and also, and then oftentimes they will put in not even just a scanned version of it, but they'll put in, you know, the contacts list. Oh, if he can't make decisions for himself, he said he wants his adult daughter. This is her telephone number to call. And then even if you're in Arizona, if that hospital system can link into the Epic network, and they've got huge servers all over the place then they can see, oh, wow, since he can't give me the answer to questions now, it says his daughter, he wants his daughter to make, make the choices for him. Thank you. Epic is a, a beast of a computer system, but there are some good benefits to it. So now we've, we've talked about it's important to have a designated agent and who should be your designated agent? This is not the the right answer, not the same answer for everyone. It, it certainly needs to be someone that knows you well and knows how you think, someone that cares about your well-being and someone that can, can make difficult decisions because someone cares about you and knows you well. The person you're choosing, if they can't make difficult decisions, they may not be the best candidate to be your, your designated agent. Um, this a spouse would be a fantastic um, decider for most people. But if your spouse says, I can't do that, don't list them. Don't force them into it. If your spouse is under the assumption that, yes, of course, I'd be their deciding agent and, and instead you listed a friend, don't surprise your spouse at that time and at the time that you're incapacitated and in the ICU you know, make sure that you discuss with the people around you who you want making decisions. So there's no surprises at the end. Um, that sounds like an extremely specific word of caution, almost like something that's happened. Oh, it happens more frequently than you'd imagine. Um, also, probably don't have people with a potential conflict of interest. Um, I, I, I think your physicians are incredibly important and helpful at advising you. Most physicians, unless you have a personal relationship with them, most physicians would say, no, I don't want to be your designated agent, um, especially if they're your treating physician. And they have a little bit of a, a conflict of interest with that. Not quite as much as, say, the funeral home director who says, let him go, let him go, let him go, because potentially they'll be getting some income out of the deal um, or, you know, potentially a nursing home administrator that is going to keep you as a resident at the nursing home longer. So think long and hard about, could this person have a conflict of interest? There's always the concern of if there's money in a will that someone could get. I, I don't think those are quite as important as non-family members making decisions um, that could stand to gain quite a bit of money. But again, decisions, you know, for each individual to come up with on their own. Now, if we flip the coin just a little bit there, if you are someone's designated agent, hopefully you know that in advance and it's not a surprise and you get a, a phone call that you need to decide on someone's behalf. Um, if you are someone's designated agent, they have listed you because you know how they think and what they've said and they trust you. And they're trusting you to be their voice. So it's very important that you are not answering on behalf of yourself. I can't stand to lose, insert whoever's name. It's if they were speaking to the doctor, what would they say? Um, so trying to voice what they would be saying is kind of the way to look at it. Um, things like oftentimes... Families will say, oh, he's a fighter, but 
you know, sort of taking into context, what is your loved one or, or the person that you're the designee for? What are they fighting for? If it hurts every time they take a breath or every time they move, is that a fight that they would want to continue fighting? Even if they've previously said, I want everything done, that's everything done in the context of being restored to health. And if it's all the data is pointing to, they're not going to be restored to health and they're going to be suffering horribly, what would they say of that point? And if, if that was the information? Again, none of these are easy choices to make. All the more reason discussing is important. What other questions so far? We're getting very close to the end here. I'm going to throw just a couple of uh, a couple of points out there for people's consideration, and these are in the uh, the outline that you have. But um, yeah, have lots of copies of all these documents. Anybody whose name is in the documents should have a copy. Um, yeah, do not keep them in your safe deposit box. Your doctor, your attorney, you're admitted to a healthcare facility. All of them should have copies. Uh, I believe in St. John, they participate in the Vial of Life program. The fire department will give you a sticker and you put it on the refrigerator and they give you a container and you put your medication lists and all these forms. Uh, your paramedics, if they come to your house, are probably going to look in the refrigerator to look for medication uh, and they will see that. Uh, other departments may have different things. Um, you can place a card in your wallet by your ID that says where people can find documents uh, or who to contact. Uh, if you're going to do that, uh, make sure it's specific. Um, you know, there's a red folder in the cabinet above the stove. Um, you know, don't say it's in the basement. Um, so there are some things you can do to kind of point people in that direction. Uh, I know we mentioned in the morning session that um, you can get a DNR bracelet. Um, I don't know if that's available for other types of these forms, but uh, that might be something to investigate uh, as well. And I'll throw this out there. Um, yeah, these are set it and forget it is great for your instant pot, not for your health and well-being. Uh, there's the five and a half D's. It used to be the five D's and we had to add another one. Um, revisit these every decade. If there is a divorce, if there's a major diagnosis and the half D is, if that diagnosis is some kind of dementia, um, you want to jump on this quickly because you may have a limited window of time during which people can say, yes, the person made the decision when they were of sound mind. Um, when there is a death of someone close to you, uh, often you see these sorts of things happen. You may have different thoughts after seeing what happened to this person. Uh, if there's some sort of noticeable decline in your health, um, you may want to reassess what you want people to do for you. Yeah, I think that was basically this this whole slide here. Um, again, revisit some of these things periodically. Um, as a an emergency physician and as a critical care physician, I would make some general recommendations if if you're healthy at baseline and you have a good quality of life. And and again, each person defines the own their own quality of life. I think a few minutes of CPR, a few defibrillations, a few days on mechanical ventilation, a few days of, of life support, those are all perfectly reasonable. Think of Damar Hamlin. Um, if it's a little unclear, ask your medical team. Or if you don't trust the medical team taking care of you in the hospital or the ICU, um, asking for a second opinion. Again, this is more in the context of if this is a family member. Typically, if you're on full life support and, and after cardiac arrest initially, you won't be having many conversations. You'll be kind of sedated on the breathing machines. Asking the medical team, how long should we wait? When will we know if we're going to expect to see improvement versus not? Typically, it's any sort of prognostication within the first 72 hours after someone's heart stops to see is their brain going to recover. Um, within the first 72 hours, uh, medical professionals are horribly unreliable unless there's other information like 
MRI pictures and things like that, but sort of supporting the body as best as possible and then seeing what's what's the function of the brain. Um, for people with advanced disease at baseline, again, if you feel your quality of life is not very good at, at your baseline, you can take control of that destiny. You can say, I don't want CPR. I don't want intubation. If it's my time, I'm ready to go. I, I think the non-invasive ventilation, if someone has some pneumonia or someone has some you know, fluid in the lungs, give some medicines to see if you can dry out the lungs. Give some of the CPAP masks or the BiPAP masks a trial and, and see if someone improves. But Putting someone on a breathing machine if if they already feel that they don't have a very good quality of life is maybe not the right route to go. Um, this maybe puts it a little more in, it's ultimately all in God's hands, but this, you know, says we're not going to intervene as much. And certainly if someone does not have a very good quality of life and they feel that they're, they're reaching the end of their life, um, CPR is only going to delay things. So... I would say probably don't don't request CPR if if you feel that you're nearing the end of your life at baseline. I also put in their advanced age. Even a perfectly healthy 105-year-old has parts that probably wore out a good long time ago. Someone that's 105 um, was expected to live about 60 years when they were born. So age does factor into many of these calculations because the ability to heal as someone ages declines. And again, all the body parts were not designed to live for 110, 120 years necessarily. Uh, other just sort of big sweeping things are don't plan on a miracle. Um, sometimes miracles do happen, but don't bank on that as the the reason to avoid having these conversations, even though they're difficult and painful conversations. And please don't let, let lack of planning become someone else's emergency, thrusting these decisions onto someone that nobody wants to make these decisions. So choosing people that can make the best decisions for you and discussing with them what you want is going to make their life much easier. And then telling them, what do you want? Quantity more than quality or quantity to a point. I want to try a little bit of time on a breathing machine, a little bit of time on the life support. And if it's not working, nope, I'm ready to go. Keep me comfortable. Or if people value quality entirely and they want the last few months of their life, if they have a, a bad cancer diagnosis, they don't want to go through all of that. So these are all things to discuss um, in case someone can't say that on their own. Please document your wishes and then ultimately, you know, discussing with family so that everyone knows what, what you want. This is, I think Eric referenced this website already, the indianapost.org. This has all of the advanced directives forms. This has the do not resuscitate form. Um, and they update this website every time one of the forms changes. If it's a, a signed form that... Um, you know, there's a new version of a certain form. It'll get posted up here. If you have a form that's signed, if there's a newer version of the form that comes out, it doesn't mean your version of the signed form is instantly invalidated. But if you're filling out the paperwork, you might as well fill out the most up-to-date version of the form you can. All right, and then we'll just close with everyone is going to die and we can control a little bit of that and we can control sort of our mortal ending. But as Eric mentioned, Good Friday always comes before Easter. So what questions do you have? So in addition to this directives, how about HIPAA waiver? Is that necessary? The HIPAA things? The health insurance portability and and privacy right so that is waiver waiver or hipaa oh if if someone is activated as your power of attorney 
Yes. Then they they kind of instantly get access to all your information. If they're making choices for you, they need all the data points to which they can make those choices. So by by sort of making someone your designated power of attorney, when you are not or when you are designated incapacitated, um, and I'm not quite sure the process in Indiana, in Wisconsin, it's if two physicians say, or a physician and a psychologist say, nope, this person can't be making decisions. And sometimes that's because they're on life support on a breathing machine, they can't participate in conversations. Um, but it's two physicians signing a form saying that their their power of attorney needs to be activated at this point. In Indiana, I'm not sure if it's one physician can make that declaration or two, or most of the time it, it does not need to go to a judge to sign, yes, this person can't make decisions on their own. Um, but as soon as that uh, power of attorney is activated, then then that designee gets access to the medical records so they can make the best choices. Thank you. But until that form is signed or un until that that power of attorney is activated, whoever you put on the line as your your designee, they can't just log in and look at all your medical records. Well, also when you um, when you sign in or sign all the papers at your general practitioner's office, or when you go to the hospital, they ask you who could, who they can speak to, besides you, and question and give information to, and anybody that you want to have have access to your medical records, you can put on that list. Correct. Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can make decisions for you. So you can add people that, you know, for, especially for minor children, if my kids get a lab resulted, um, they don't know what to do with that. So it gets sent to me or you can, you can designate, I want my medical information to be shared with these people um, or these individuals. But unless you have that power of attorney, figured out they can know the information but they they don't have the authorization to act on it it would just allow them to find out the information before the power of attorney is enacted correct okay. Any other questions? And certainly it's a take in. I'm sure questions will bubble up, you know, kind of as you reflect on this and think about it. Uh, like I said, all those forms, I uh, put the link in the chat. I'll also send that out to everybody on Monday uh, with our update for next week's session. Um, you know, by all means, uh, make an appointment to talk with your physician. Um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to talk with you about some of these things. Um, but like I said, we hope this is the start of a conversation. Um, we hope this gives you everything you need to get the ball rolling on these things. I guess I, guess I, have, I have one, one follow-up question. Um, I, I uh, you know, must confess um, as a, as a former Catholic, I haven't done this yet. So I've, uh, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. But anyway, um, the um, the question I had was on the um, the mechanical ventilation. That that's that's one thing that frankly scares the hell out of me, and I can't I can't fathom ever wanting that. I guess there are probably a few a few instances where if you undergo a procedure, you have to do it. But it it as an ICU doctor, I mean, can can you confirm to me that that's a it's a horrible experience to both get it and also to get out of it? You know, once they withdraw the the tube from your throat, um, to there's that point of being able to breathe on your own, maybe, maybe not. So I get you know my point is 
if, if I was writing my thing right now, I would say I don't ever want to be under any kind of mechanical um, ventilator. Um, so mechanical ventilation, have you ever had surgery of anything before? No, not, nothing more than a stent put in through the through a um, through my leg for, a, leg for a heart attack. Yeah. So for for anyone that's that's on the call that's had a surgery before, where they take you to the operating room and they put you to sleep, chances are you've been on a mechanical ventilator. An anesthesia machine is a mechanical ventilator that they also can mix in some some sleeping gases with. So. People go in the operating room and out of the operating room every day. The longer term mechanical ventilation for a few days to a few weeks, um, probably in, in the ICU I work in about uh, a third to half of the patients at some point during their stay are on, I'm in the medical respiratory intensive care unit, are on a mechanical ventilator. And you know, sometimes it's because someone has a pneumonia and we're we're buying them a little more time for the lungs to heal. Or sometimes it's because someone had a, a stroke and they're just not able to protect their breathing. So we have the machine kind of help out for a while. So mechanical ventilation by itself is not at all a, a death sentence. Um, it can be a little unpleasant. It's a machine doing the breathing for you. Usually we have people on sedation because that tube sitting on your tongue is not always the most comfortable experience. Um, but certainly it's it saved a lot of lives. It was first started used in maybe the 1950s or so, uh, mechanical ventilator machines. So they've been around for a long time and, and outcomes from being on a machine, it depends entirely on why someone ends up on the machine. If it's because they had a devastating stroke, they're probably not going to do well. The machine is to to see if they'll recover. Um, if someone is going to the operating room for getting their appendix out, chances are it's going to be a very brief time on that machine and they're going to do well. So it depends a little bit, again, on, on the context of why that breathing tube might be needed. And if you start on the machine or if, if someone has started on a breathing machine and, and you see that someone's not recovering and they're not getting better, choices can always be made to, it's not working, let's stop. So I, I don't think a, a hard, no, I never want that um, is always the right answer. But again, it's it's a little contextual a little bit as well. Okay. That was sort of a non-answer, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I, I get the idea. Like maybe for routine stuff, very routine stuff, yes. Other than that, no. That that might be a that might be the proper response in in my case. Yeah, and I think discussing discussing with your you know designated POA, like for some things, I think it would be great. For other things, I wouldn't want to be on a breathing machine. Or let's try it out for a few days, and in that post form, you can specify. I want to try it for three days. Problem is, what if what if you need it for three and a half days and all the signs are pointing towards you're probably going to get better. Um, you just need slightly longer than what you wrote in that form. And that's where discussing with the, the power of attorney person, like, oh, wow, if it's just a little bit longer, it's going against his written wishes. But you know what? If he wants to get better and he needs another few hours, yes. Let's let's do it a little bit longer. Hey, thank you. So while you're on that slide, could you explain what is that green stack on the left? What's the blue host on the right? And what's the clear host on the top there? Oh, sure. So this um this is actually a picture that was published in it was maybe 2010 or so. And it was a, a study where they looked at people that have very sick lungs they compared them to people with very sick lungs who were face up versus face down on the breathing machine. So this person is face down on the bed because we actually have a little bit more lung towards our back than we do towards the front of our chest. And they found that if people lay on their front, we can oxygenate them a little bit better. So that's the reason this guy's laying on his front. And then during the COVID pandemic, 
we had a lot of people laying on their front because their oxygen levels were better. Now, the, the thing with all the green towards the left of the screen there, those are IV pumps. So those are our medicines. Each of those sort of levels of that is a different medicine that's going into someone. So I would guess they're on some medicine to make them sleepy, maybe some medicine to paralyze their muscles to let the machine do all the work of the breathing. They may be on um, some nutrition going in through the vein. They may be on some antibiotics. So lots and lots of medicines. Um, that's kind of the, the machine over to the left there with all the little hoses. And then the blue tube um, kind of up above his head, that's one of the tubes that connects the, the breathing machine to the, the breathing tube going in his lungs. And then the machine... I don't know, I can't see it right now because I have the, the pictures over towards the right of the screen. But that machine over towards the right of the screen is the mechanical ventilator. And it it's basically a fancy fan. It blows air into people's lungs. And I can, as the doctor, I can program how much volume of air to blow in their lungs or how much pressure of air and how much oxygen in that air. So there's a few things I can do with that, but it, it's basically a fancy fan. So that that was what was in short supply during COVID, that fan? Yep, the, the ventilator. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Well, the old clock on the... Uh home office wall here says that uh, we, we have reached our time and a little more. Um, but uh, Adam, thank you so much for your time and putting this together uh, and for being with us. Uh, certainly has given us a lot of food for thought and hopefully has um, given folks a little bit clearer idea of some of the things you can specify ahead of time. And uh, as we've said uh, in previous sessions and tonight, um, whatever you do decide, tell tell everyone who might possibly end up in the room or getting a call. Um, you can't, you can't over communicate these things. And uh, certainly if you have questions or whatever that uh, you want to follow up, reach out to me and I will uh, uh, get that, that follow up going. Um, but if there is nothing else, why don't we go ahead and uh, end our study tonight, praying the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you everyone for uh, being here and your participation. Um, the recording will go up uh, probably tomorrow, uh, probably alongside the one from this morning. So if you feel like you missed something and want to go back for it, it will be waiting for you. Thank you, Dr. Adam. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adam. Thank, thank you, Dr. Adam and Dr. I mean, Pastor Eric for setting all this up. I, I am Dr. Eric. I knew that yeah. too. <laughs> so, all right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, everyone stay uh, warm, dry, and safe. Good night. All right. Thank Good you. Night. Take care. Good night.